Uh, with that said, I'd like to call upon the first speaker for proposition. Uh, take my POIs and check, please. In the US, conservative media organizations focused on the economic harms of lockdown. Voters in conservative states then postponed lockdowns leading to thousands of preventable COVID deaths. Technically reporting on the economic harm is not false news, but representing it as the only factor to consider is still dangerous because it distorts reality through the omission of fair opposition. Our problem is that media bias results in people acting on incomplete information and the impact of polarized media on how people engage with one another and vote. Under a fairness doctrine, organizations would also include the view that lockdowns are necessary and people would then have the ability to decide what they want to prioritize instead of being fed conclusions from the very start. Our model comes in three parts. Firstly, fairness doctrines would mandate that corporately owned broadcast news media on television, radio, newspapers, magazines, news podcasts, and their social media content would follow two main conditions. When covering controversial issues of public importance, such as welfare policy and social issues, the two conditions are firstly granting equal airtime and coverage to differing viewpoints, and secondly, giving an accurate representation of those differing viewpoints by finding the people with adequate qualification to represent them. We recognize that it is not always possible to do this perfectly. And in those instances, media organizations would provide proof of an attempt to do this to the best of their abilities. Secondly, we would mandate that equal access to campaign advertising and airtime be given to candidates during elections. Thirdly, existing media regulators that currently regulate hate speech and fake news would take on this mandate. Functionally, this would look like the FCC in the US, where no one party can have more than three of its five members, and the CRTC in Canada and the Press Council of India. The regulatory body would then flag violations, and courts would finally determine whether those violations have occurred. Even when organizations technically comply with all of these elements, if they still show a pattern of subverting the spirit of fairness doctrines, we can still fine organizations as fit by measuring malicious intent. What this is not is a state dictation of what issues organizations can cover, so they retain discretion over that. Before I move on into argumentation, I can take a POI. So the vast majority of the people within the FCC are people that either have political incentives for the future or people who are already involved in politics. How can you ensure that yours that is not going to be an unjust government intervention? We think that most of these organizations are formed under parliamentary bills. So all parties have direct influence over who gets appointed into those committees and the balancing of incentives of all of those people mean that there is never an in instance in which one party has an unfair advantage leading to government abuse. I'll be proving this later with an argumentation as well. Our first argument then is on the legitimacy of implementation. On a first level, the state has a direct obligation to provide balanced information because it derives its legitimacy from individuals voluntarily giving the state the power to uh, the ability to exert its power by making an informed vote. The state should then attempt to facilitate this informed choice as much as possible where it is possible. On a second level then, why is this individual right to an informed choice not fully protected in status quo? It is because people have limited control over what media they're able to consume. This is because they have limited time. People cannot watch multiple channels at once and research all viewpoints. They have limited knowledge. So dissecting data about social issues on your own is a very laborious uh, procedure and therefore people are not able to do it. People also expect fair representation. So when the media reports a biased view, consumers do not always know that they're being denied legitimate information. So there's no accountability for it. The right to choice is best facilitated when people form informed choices. Even if people willingly choose to live in echo chambers, we as a state still have a duty to uphold the overall right to informed choice in as many instances as possible, which is not possible under biased media consumption, even if you opted into it. This is true even if opposition says that all opinions are valid regardless of how people arrived at it, because this ignores the fact that bias causes direct harm to third parties. For example, if you're only exposed to racist ritual without any opposition, that negatively impacts the way that you see minorities and directly hurts those communities. That is why the state should intervene. 
The third area of this argument is that commercial rights are not absolute. Speech concerning public affairs is not a direct form of expression. It is more so a form of awareness so that people are able to govern themselves. News media has actively abused this mandate because it is captured by private interest. It looks like Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post and using it to whitewash the actions of Amazon. It looks like right-wing media being funded by the private prison lobby like the CCA. This bias is unjust because the media is what bridges the gap between voting issues and voters. Much in the same way that opposition parties grant voting choices, it is opposing information that gives you the ability to think critically and choose your political leaning. This argument is important because we give you three standards for the government legitimacy in intervening. Firstly, that the state obligation to provide balanced information exists. Secondly, that the individual right to inform choice is better facilitated on our side of the house. And thirdly, why both of those things matter more than corporate profit, because media is a public, public good. Our second argument then is on why we have a better representation of issues by reducing polarization. Currently in status quo, news media has little incentive to include the opposing view. This is because they are catering to viewer bases that demand a specific political meaning. There are also multiple sources that are reporting on limited issues. So organizations attempt to differentiate themselves by accusing other news media of inaccuracy. Therefore, there is a collective action in eliminating this bias. Studies show, for example, that around 66% of people say that news organizations in general are often inaccurate, but only 30% say the same about the news that they view the most. Even when the opposing view is presented, it is often misrepresented, like using extreme examples of violent protests during the BLM protests and using fundamentalists from the far right to represent the entirety of the right wing. People then retain an unfair characterization of the other side, and there's no incentive to watch multiple channels because they believe that that is engagement enough. This is where other forms of checking also fall short. When it comes to fact checking, this is done retrospectively. So the damage of exposure to false information is already done. Even if reporting is factually correct, it may still be biased and therefore misleading, like using crime rates in black neighborhoods to portray the narrative that those places need to be over-policed. Even declaring bias is not enough because people will eventually discount these disclaimers because the news will still be presented as objectively correct and they become increasingly incognizant of these declarations over time. On our comparative, the incentives of news media organizations change. Firstly, the media has an incentive to present the opposing view to avoid the repercussions of having to pay fines and damages to their reputation through the process of litigation. Therefore, they will react to this by making structural changes, like hiring politically diverse journalists to produce more balanced news stories. Secondly, we eliminate the collective action problem as all organizations have to comply. There is an incentive for governments to be fair in how they implement this, because companies themselves can counter sue the state if they think that they are being unfairly treated. News organizations, because of their significant reach, capture public attention and therefore their scrutiny as well. Opposition parties have an incentive to hold incumbent governments responsible, so the margin for abuse is very unlikely. There are two impacts that follow from this. Firstly, it becomes hard to mischaracterize opposition. For example, you cannot conflate increasing regulation of guns with taking away gun rights entirely when a proponent of gun regulation has to be present on that panel and can immediately correct for that mis misconception. We also correct with echo chambers because echo chambers in broadcast media is eliminated with the introduction of opposition and social media echo chambers are less damaging because there's a counterweight to it in traditional media. On our side, people with current biases may not entirely change, but the viewer base that we change are people that grow up consuming news on our side of the house. They enter a media landscape that is a lot more balanced and cyclically this is beneficial as people are more willing to engage with opposition, leading to more holistic policies for everyone. For all of these reasons, propose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker and I'd like to now call upon the first speaker for the opposition. I would like to confirm that I am visible and audible. You are. Okay. I like to take verbal POIs. Starting my speech in three, two, one. 
Hidden beneath the lights of TV broadcasting is the shadow of political polarization and corrupt governmental incentives. It is only through protecting the freedom of reporting that breaks apart the illusion of fairness we are proud to oppose. Two arguments from first speaker. First, fairness doctrine forces people to shift to alternative media, which furthers polarization. Second, Fairness doctrine significantly hinders media's ability to report on crucial issues. But before that, a brief note on our stance and rebuttals to their case. What is our stance? Quite simply, we envision our world to look much like the status quo, in which the broadcasters have the freedom to carry out their own discretions. Therefore, we're fine with things like Fox News leaning slightly more towards conservative views or CNN and BBC being by and large progressive. Given this, three points of rebuttals from side opposition. First thing, I'd like to clarify that alternative media such as social media and such would not be a part of their fairness doctrine mandate. This is because the motion reads media with significant audience reach and also news media. We think that many media channels are consistent of little viewers following individual channels. And we think that on our side, social media and such would be claimed as alternative media. Second thing about the feasibility of their case. Fairness doctrine is not necessarily a just and neutral metric as side proposition frames it to be. This is because the people who constitute the FCC board will be biased because they're selected by the government and they do not want to risk losing their jobs. This means that they're likely going to go with the government's incentive. No, the government have an inherent interest in controlling information. For example, government have the incentive to not determine certain topics as controversial to prevent political uprisings. For example, for instance, abortion is never officially determined as controversial in the Philippines, despite the fact that many women are upset by this law. However, because the government is Catholic, having the media report on these issues will cut down on their profit. Contro uh, controversy, therefore, becomes an unreliable metric because obviously abortion needs to be challenged. But on their side, this will be determined as not controversial and not important. Final thing, responding on their polarization and principle claim about full information given to the people. My first argument proves that their side has more polarization, and my second argument proves that their side flushes out less information. This directly engages with their case on perception and choice. This is because you're going to harm people in which they're going to base their perception on the world full of information that's extremely polarizing, but also things like incorrect statistics that are made without any accountability, um, accountability mechanism on their truth. We take down their principle because your side fails to be shaped by even worse information, which will all pro be proven within my speech. First argument then, fairness doctrine forces people to shift to alternative media, which uh, furthers polarization. The thesis of this argument is that people will have more incentive to opt into alternative media, which means the worst type of impacts will arise. I'd like to clarify that there are two groups of people who will consume mainstream media. First, the majority who are moderate swing viewers. These are the people who do not have strong political affiliation. Second, people who politically identify with certain ideologies, but are not extremists. For example, these are the people who watch mainstream media, such as Fox News. These are the people who will be pushed away from the mainstream media and opt into alternative alternative media. First analysis then on why people shift to alternative media on their side of the house. Firstly, it is uncomfortable for people to confront challenging views on a daily basis, which directly question their political beliefs. But secondly, people want to have their ideas confirmed because it makes them feel safer and more comfortable. If the media includes both sides, without reassurance, people would not know which side to necessarily believe in and feel anxious. Thirdly, people lose their trust in media outlets and therefore opt into alternative media sources. This empowers political opposition claims that the state is attempting to take over the minds of people. People on alternative media who advertise themselves as the only people who are telling the truth will sound more convincing for people to opt into their platforms. Second analysis then on why this is harmful. Alternative media has more propensity to escalate extremism. Firstly, because lack of accountability. Even if people lie and broadcast fake news on alternative media sources, they maintain their platform because people who opt into their channel actively by buying into the narrative. Secondly, because of media platform incentives 
to cater towards extremism. The reason for this is because in order to sustain viewership and reflect on niche political ideologies that their viewers have, they will lean towards broadcasting in that specific direction and magnifying the view to take advantage. Their analysis, what is the counterfactual then? Mainstream media, even if they're politically biased, have a larger degree of accountability mechanism that keeps them in check and thus far more moderate. Two reasons why. Firstly, leaning to extremism is likely going to result in reduced viewership because being able to gain few extremist viewers does not justify losing a greater number of more moderate ones. Know that most of the viewers that exist in status quo are more moderate. But secondly, it is also likely going to reduce corporate sponsorship because companies are unwilling to be associated with extremism insofar as public image impacts their profit. It. This comes in ways like stock prices, right? Corporations generally do not want to associate themselves with extremist medias because they will lose more capital from those who boycott their products for extremist ideologies. Fourth analysis on why this will be the tipping point. Alternative medias are the only ones who explicitly promote discrimination and agitate violence against minority groups. For example, active violence against racial minority masturbating at the mosque. Given all these analysis, the implication of this argument is that it flips their case on the echo chamber, which means people will become more extreme and carry out actions like hate crimes. Second argument then, on why fairness doctrine significantly hinders media's ability to report on crucial issues. The thesis of this argument is that fairness doctrine will reduce media corporations' revenue and reduce capacity of the media to report on especially minorities. Fairness doctrine reduces the revenue of media corporations for two reasons. Firstly, media outlets will be far less attractive for sponsors since they will not be able to leverage the media to reflect their interests. For example, on their side, Amazon would not be able to ask media outlets to not report on the breakup of GAFA since it harms their profit. This makes it less likely on their side of the world for media outlets to receive monetary gains since corporations will resort to other ways of achieving this, such as launching advertisement posts on social media will become a cheaper alternative for corporations to gain back their lost profit. Secondly, all of the mechanisms that I have proven in my first argument proves that people lose the interest into mainstream media. This leads to media outlets losing their viewers because they're unable to make their news contents intuitively interesting to watch. This re uh, results in reduced capacity of the media to report. Two things will happen. First, they have less capacity to hire reporters, establish bases in various places, and fund long-term reportings, etc. But second, their programmers will shift away from news in favor of entertainment-oriented contents, which are more appealing, which reduces exposure to news reports. Why is this important then? Three impacts. First, there are going to be less reporting on underprivileged areas, such as poor communities or developing countries, which reduces scrutiny on their governance as well as support to the people, for example, donation to victims of calamity. But second, less long-form journalism that exposes covert problems as it takes longer and is less certain, for example, corruption, sexual abuses in Catholic churches, and etc. But finally, people in general are going to be less aware of current affairs on their side both because there are less news programs and less people who watch their views. Ultimately, my two arguments are able to provide why on their side, they will create more polarization and more misinformation, which takes down their claim on principle. Fairness doctrine is anything but fair. I have never been so proud to oppose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker and I'd like to now call upon the second speaker for the proposition. Hi, can everybody hear me? I can. Thanks. I can. Uh, I'll take QIs in chat, please.
On one hand, when it was convenient for them, viewers of traditional media were so intolerant of being exposed to the other side. And they said that this would create so much cognitive dissonance that they would have no other alternative but to switch to alternative media such as social media. But simultaneously, when trying to justify why traditional media has better incentives, they say that those same moderates don't want to lean towards extremism because it means that you would likely not want to continue to watch those same news organizations and that corporate sponsorships would no longer exist. There's a tension in the case of the opposition. Either it is true that the vast majority of viewers are moderates, in which case implementing the fairness doctrine would not drive them towards alternative media, given that they are not intolerant of being exposed to the other side. But even in their best case, where it's only a minority of individuals that are moderates, the switch towards extremism is likely to influence traditional media as well, which proves why our problem of political polarization will likely continue to exist in the world of the opposition. They need to resolve this tension in the next speech. The second observation that I want to make at the top of this speech is opposition's lack of a counterfactual. Given that we have already preempted by any form of fact-checking or declaring biases is insufficient, which they did not respond to, the problems of political polarization, of omitting information in order to manipulate and twist stories in your favor, over-reporting crime statistics, to try to demonize minority communities and encourage over-policing, under-reporting things like the state abuses through the war on drugs, doing things like selectively picking information are likely to continue in the world of the opposition. Given their complete lack of a counterfactual and the explicit concession that they support status quo, they need to weigh why these problems aren't as significant as we portray them to be. Three areas of response in this speech. First, on the likelihood of state abuse. Second, on political polarization. Thirdly, on corporate revenue. First, on the likelihood of state abuse. They say that regulatory agencies will be biased towards pandering to political parties. I have a number of responses to this argument. The first thing that I want to point out is that their characterization of the power that we give regulatory agencies is in tension with the model that we presented of what the fairness doctrine would look like. To be clear, news organizations still have the ambit to determine what news stories they report on, and the state cannot determine what is and isn't a controversial issue, which isn't something that the fairness doctrine would cover. So their example of the Philippines and the government not considering certain issues to be controversial and using that to silence dissent would not likely occur on either, on, on either side of the house, given that neither side has the ability to dictate what news stories are covered. But let's be charitable. Let's assume what they meant to say was that the state will find a way to abuse the fairness doctrine to shut down news broadcasts by preventing news organizations from broadcasting, even on issues that they have selected. The response that I want to make to this is that the fairness doctrine does not enable the unilateral censorship of news stories by governments because the fairness doctrine does not allow for the state censorship in the first place. You cannot prevent a broadcast from airing that is critical of the government or exposes government corruption, for example. At best, the fairness doctrine can be used to compel news organizations to do things like invite government pundits to share their views on these stories or to share government propaganda or the government's official stance on these particular issues. So to be clear, there is no justification under which the fairness doctrine could be used to totally silence any news reporting that is critical of the government. At best, you would have to add to that news reporting something that is favorable towards the government, in which case we think that if there's strong evidence for things like state abuse or state corruption, people are still likely to be exposed to the necessary information even on our side of the house. Secondly, I would point out that there are other political parties and checking mechanisms that even in the weakest of democracies can be relied upon. The independence of courts in most democracies is something that exists. And we think that if courts are given the ability to determine whether something is in compliance with the fairness doctrine, they are unlikely to want to appeal to political parties given that they have lifetime appointments. Other political parties are likely to want to protect media freedom given that, that it is these political parties that air opposition use. The third broad response that I want to make is that even if there was some capacity for state abuse, the incentives of governments to not use the fairness doctrine are strong. Firstly, there is a strong fear among the public of media manipulation, given the significance that we place on the importance of a free media. Importantly, this exists even in the weakest of democracies, given that in most countries, elections are somewhat democratic. We've already seen this in their own example of the Philippines, for example, where Duterte was voted out partly due to backlash surrounding his campaign of media crackdowns on organizations like ABS and CBN. So clearly there is a high degree of value that the public places on media freedom and backlash against media crackdowns. Secondly, there's the fear that the process itself will become politicized when you as the government are not in power and are the opposition 
opposition party. So there's an incentive to guarantee that the process itself and regulatory bodies are immune to politicization. Their own example of the FCC proves this point because the FCC has written into its rules that out of the five members that sit on its board, none can be directly involved with the political party and only three can even directly endorse one political party at a time. And so there's an incentive to make sure that there's a balance of representation within regulatory bodies because governments come in and out of power. Finally, I want to flip this argument. We think that the fairness doctrine can actually be used to do things like minimize state propaganda because it can be leveraged by opposition parties to co-opt the viewer bases and airtime that state propaganda channels have, given that they can use the fairness doctrine to say that we want a balanced perspective on issues, even on state propaganda and state news channels. And so we think that we have a counterbalance against um, against state propaganda itself as well. Finally, on reducing political polarization, they say that this will create a shift to alternative media. The first thing that I would point out is that there are limited instances in which we can also apply the fairness doctrine to the kind of alternative media that they talk about. Look at the Ben Shapiro show, for example. Perhaps it exists on social media, but functionally it is registered as a company and it serves the same purpose as any other news organization like CNN, courts would be able to determine that the fairness doctrine applies to these organizations as well. But we can see that there are some shows to which we will be able to apply the doctrine. In those instances, I would point out that the degree of substitutability between internet shows and alternative media and traditional media is highly limited, Hence why most extremists have not already shifted to alternative media. There's a level of familiar, familiarity associated with traditional media, given that it is what you grow up with. People who daily watch people like Tucker Carlson or Don King, for example, older people are far less likely to be able to transition to social media, given that they have grown up with broadcast and traditional media. And so this switch is unlikely. Finally, even if some people switch to alternative media, the moderates that they talked about are unlikely to switch. It is true that these people dislike cognitive dissonance, but they also value the trustworthiness of traditional media moreover. The fact that they are currently not exposed to alternative views is merely a product of the fact that they don't want to exert effort. Before I move on, I'll take the point. So our, so argument, our argument isn't that we're going to use to move to alternate media. Our argument is that those few individuals that do are going to do massive harm. You have to engage the actual argument. Those individuals would have likely shifted on your side of the house as well, given that their incentives were to have extremist views. Comparatively, we think that if the social media presence of traditional media organizations on social media itself is far more by far less by strata, we think that it is far more likely that on our side of the house, fewer people make the switch towards extremism. Comparatively, uh, finally, rather on their point about corporate revenue, they say that this cannot, that you can no longer use money to leverage media interests. I would point out that this is probably a good thing if it means that you cannot pay for stories that show you in a favorable light. It means that there's less media manipulation overall. But secondly, I would point out that no media organization is at a competitive disadvantage, given that all of them have to comply with the fairness doctrine. So to say that you would no longer be profitable is untrue, given that these media organizations already have widespread reach. We think that it is likely, even if there's a reduction in their overall profits, that they remain profitable enough for investors to remain, given the sunk cost that they have already made in these organizations. Perhaps news media are not as well funded as we would like them to be. But if they are consistently reporting in a fair and balanced way, that is a trade-off that we are willing to make for all of these reasons proposed. All right, I'd like to thank the second proposition speaker and call upon the second opposition speaker. Hi, am I clear, audible and visible? Yeah. I'll take purists through chat. I'll probably ask for around my six minutes. Speech will start in three, two, one. Proposition's idea of neutrality is nothing more than a facade that entrenches people further into the evils of alternative media. Even if the most important issues are broadcasted on most, the minority issues, the long-term issues that need investigative journalism is what they have to lose out on. I've never been prouder to oppose. Two sections of response to the speech, first regarding the principle and secondly on decreasing polarization. Firstly, let's talk about the principle. Proposition says that people make better political decisions because they have more information. Three layers of response. 
One, this principle doesn't stand for two reasons. A, the premise of this principle is that people don't have control over the media they consume right now. I think this is false because sure, maybe you can't watch two TV channels at once, but you can watch various TV channels in the limited amount of time span that you have. We think their cherry-picked characterization to say that people only watch BBC and status quo is unrealistic, especially in the age of information and variety. Secondly, I would rather posit to you that we are the prerequisite to their principle because we prove in the second argument that the amount of information you have is inherently likely to decrease because you lose sponsors, especially especially the most crucial pieces of information, like investigative journalism, that expose the Catholic Church sex scandals. These are likely to be the ones that people have the least exposure to in their daily lives in the first place. Second response is that we achieve their end goal of the principle better, which is accountability. Their logic here is that people expect fair representation in status quo, but it's not represented in the news, which is why there's a lack of accountability. We're happy to concede that most media is not biased right now, because, it is, if, because if it was literally as extreme as they want to characterize, people would probably already call it out. I would flip this argument and say that people don't expect fair representation right now because the fairness doctrine is not implemented. Rather, on their side, uniquely create this false perception that the FCC has an incentive to make this fair doctrine seem effective and people have a perception that the fairness doctrine is working. This policy then keeps audiences from critically thinking about the news they consume, whereas on our side, consumers are aware and know that the news they're receiving is biased, which means they're more likely to do things like research on their own. Thirdly, of response, even if this is true, we don't think it is just for a third party intervention to happen to decide what is controversial or problematic, insofar as it does not fit three criteria. Firstly, unlike what the proposition side asserts, this bias does not cause harm to third parties. Secondly, it is not false information which is already banned in the status quo. The more likely characterization is that this is probably going to look things like increased value to tax or hosting national funeral of Abe Shinzo, which is likely to be the more controversial issues in the status quo. But thirdly, it is inherently speculative as to what information is correct or beneficial in democracy. It is then unjust for the government to decide and limit what people's communities and voices look like and how they want to represent their viewpoints online. Thus, regardless of the practical outcome, it is an unjust intervention. Secondly, let's talk about decreasing polarization. Proposition says they decrease polarization because you show opposing views. Three responses. Firstly, I want to characterize what media looks like on both sides of the house. Notice that this directly responds to their case, which is premised on the idea that media in status quo is terrible and that makes people act in irrational ways. All responsive characterization here is twofold. A, that even if media is slightly left or right leaning in status quo, they are not as extremist to the extent that proposition claims. Notice that they have very little characterization as to why media companies in status quo have an incentive to cater towards people with limited, limited views, which is a smaller number of people. I think that's counterintuitive. I would posit to you that in order for media companies to make profit, they need to cater towards the moderates because that's where the vast majority of their audiences lie. But secondly, that there's a long and overriding incentive to not be extreme because they will be called out by individuals. This is because false information, anti-minority sentiment, diminishes credibility and the potential of money that they could earn in the long term is taken away, which means they're likely to do things like cross-check and peer review on our side. Secondly, even if you don't buy this, for the vast majority of individuals who are moderate, by the definition they're, they're a moderate, there is a multiplicity of other factors such as nationalized education, increased exposure to information and status quo on a digital age, or having friends from various different backgrounds that deter people from being extremists in the first place, which means the likelihood of this slightly biased information making them make bad decisions in politics is unlikely in the first place. The only way that second proposition responds to this is by pointing out that there is a tension. Let me not. This is not a tension. We're telling that the vast majority of individuals are moderates, but for those few people that are extremists that become further entrenched in their eco chambers and alternative media, they do worse harm compared to the marginal benefit that they bring. This proves that media on our side is likely to stay within an acceptable range and that their characterization is unlikely. Secondly, let's put the premise of their argument, because even if we can see that information is biased on our side, I would posit to you that the forms of bias you receive on proposition is worse. And this is where we're going to introduce our new substantive argument on how the neutrality proposition supports is inherently biased to government influence. Three layers of analysis. Firstly, the premise of this argument is that media can get captured by dominant political parties. This is because the evaluation of what is controversial is likely to be determined by the state because states inherently have a lot of media control. It's unclear why the FCC has has enough power to be able to implement this in every single country, proposition does not have fiat to say this is likely to be effective. We think rather, because governments have a lot of media control, they're likely to be able to pretend controversial topics are non-controversial, and specifically regarding things like scandals or voter frauds, they can portray those issues as non-controversial because it's likely to directly harm them.
This is bad because governments have perverse incentives to hide up their failures and decrease backlash towards them. Prop first tries to model this out by saying there is going to be formed a parliamentary bill. Two responses. A, this is unlikely and they need to prove why and why they have the capacity to do so. Secondly, this, account this accountability mechanism that they say has increased, that they say exists on their side does not work. Because the way in which governments influence media is invisible. Things like tweaking how they're like tweaking how news media companies collect stats. Pressuring news media companies to say that they're going to stop funding them if they do not support their views. These are likely to be things that are done behind a screen. Second proposition then asserts that courts exist, but courts are part of the state. And a lot of the big issues that we're talking about are abuses that happen within the court as well. There is high likelihood the judges within the court are also likely to be biased. So our argument isn't that democracy or voting doesn't exist, but it's that even if these demands exist by the people, it's hard for people to find out unless you have things like long-term investigative journalism. The second thing I want to point out here is that even if if governments have good incentives, media does not have an incentive to report on it because the cost of doing so is larger than the cost of not doing so, i.e. the fact that you portray and include minority views and covering views means that you're likely to take backlash from the majority, which reduces viewers and feeds into our second argument of how this decreases minority awareness. The impact of this is twofold. Firstly, that this reduces accountability towards the state and it's harder for opposition parties to have their views presented in society. But secondly, this enhances biases because now you only have a single source that is controlled by the government, which flips government's principle because we prove that the neutrality they support is likely to be biased neutrality. The implication here is twofold. Firstly, that this flips proposition's argument on increasing exposure because we, we, because we prove that the information proposition source is not only limited in scale because A, you have less funding, but B, it's also inherently biased to government influence. So we can see that people acting on incomplete information is bad, but we would prefer a world with information that is slightly biased to having none at all, so we flip their principle. But secondly, even if some extremists stay on mainstream media, because the amount of influence they have on mainstream is diluted and it's hard for them to collectivize, the likelihood of them producing harm is small. And this is explicitly what happened when people kicked Trump out of Twitter and he formed Trump Parlor, which people used to mobilize and create demonstrative capital raids. Lastly, I'm going to weigh the best version of proposition to our argument, because even if we can see that only a few people opt into alternative media and the vast majority stay on slightly more biased mainstream media, there's an overriding harm for two reasons. Firstly, because the scale of impact is larger. Mainstream media being slightly biased is not going to be a very large harm as I proved to you above, because this is likely to remain within the scope of mainstream media, which has various alternative accountability mechanisms. On their side, there's an active incentive to want to cause harm on society because there's less accountability. Things like banning Muslim migrations, things like hate crime and anti-minority protests and blaming them for having bad economies. And thus, this harm overrides the marginal benefit. But secondly, regarding the reversibility of the impact, once people start opting into alternative media, it's extremely hard for these individuals to leave, which means the future generations and the children of these people, which means the rationality of their decisions for every other political decision they make is likely to be worse. For all those reasons, oppose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker. Just remind everyone, uh, POIs are good and uh, useful for engagement. Uh, with that said, I'd like to call upon the uh, government whip. Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. Can you see and hear me? Yep. yep. Panel, there are three clashes in my speech. The first on how people are going to react to the implementation of the Fairness Doctrine. The second on how we improve polarization and a final clash on government abuse and manipulation of the doctrine. 
first on how people are going to react to this doctrine. What they say is that people are likely to view news organizations critically right now because they're aware of the fact that these news organizations have an undertone of bias. But here's the problem panel. All their analysis is extremely assertive. Just because you know that a media organization is coming from a place of bias doesn't necessarily mean that you have an incentive to check that bias. Because as long as they're telling you what you want to hear, you are more likely to go along with it. But the next thing I want to do is clarify what a majority of viewers in this debate are. They agree with us in saying that they are moderates, but they disagree in the way in which they are going to react. And they have a conflicting characterization here. First, they say that these moderates are likely to be so intolerant of opposing views that they move to social media because they are just that radical. But in the same breath, they say that media organizations have an incentive not to be extreme because a majority of people or moderates just don't aren't extreme and would not want to listen to those views. We think these arguments undercut one another, but we think that the latter characterization is probably more true because most moderates are individuals that exist in the middle. They do understand that alternative views exist. The difference is that they're just not willing to go out and find those views because it takes a huge amount of effort in status quo. When you have biased media organizations not representing multiple views, you have to take the time out of your day to go out and find views that contradict the ones that you see on your own media channel. We think that this is just something that people don't have the time to do, but they would probably be okay with it if it was on the media channel that they consume right now. But the second thing is that these moderates just don't have the expertise to compare the view that they see on their news site and with a view that they see on another news site, because oftentimes they don't make the effort to be comparative. We think this is more an issue with effort as opposed to an issue with radicalization, which is something that we can solve on our side when the fairness doctrine is implemented. So considering that characterization of moderates in this debate, we gave you three reasons why they're unlikely to switch to social media. Firstly, because these people are just not intolerant to the extent that they say, and they haven't responded to this too much just yet. But the second thing we said is that these people are unlikely to make the effort to switch to an alternate news channel, because oftentimes these people have grown up watching the same news channel. They see it as a credible organization. It probably airs at the time that they come back home from work. The effort that they would take to find a viable alternative to that on social media is probably just going to be too great. But the final thing, is that moderates tend to be more skeptical of the information that is found solely on social media because you realize that there aren't things like very very strong checks against bias on those organizations you recognize that like fact check for example is not as strong on a social media site as it would be on a news organization and because of that there's a greater incentive to focus on uh, to stick to the broadcast organization that a uh, uh, broadcast organization that you know is credible. Even if on their best case, social media is something that people move to, note that on our side, it's comparatively better because of the fact that social media doesn't have biased news that is, that is brought on from these broadcast organizations as well. Because oftentimes the views that are brought from social media are justified by the news that is brought from broadcast organizations. Because of that, we think that social media becomes better as well. But then they backtrack in a POR and they say that people that do switch would probably not be the moderates, but that those people are the ones that would cause the most amount of harm. I would say that the people who would switch then are the extremely radical individuals, the people that are probably already on extremely extreme organizations like Parler, the people who already are extremely antagonistic to opposing views. We think that those people would likely act in similar ways on both sides of the house and they aren't the majority in this debate. So in proving to you that a majority of people wouldn't move to alternate media sites, this takes down all of their argumentation on why money will no longer exist in media to begin with, right? We think that broadcast media is always going to be relevant because it has unique access to politics in a way that no other source can have access, which is why investors are unlikely to completely pull out. But I'm going to take them at their best case. Let's assume it's true that moderates feel discomfort when they have opposing views on their existing media organizations. They need to prove why that discomfort is so incredibly high that these people become antagonistic and that they choose to move away. That is what they haven't done so far in this debate. The second clash then is on polarization and how we reduce that. But before that, I'll take a POI. So the people so the who create, people create <laughs> don't have 
So the people that create the most harm that are the extremists on your side probably don't have the capacity to mobilize on our side because there's not that type of platform that they can do that on. That's the delta of the debate. But platforms like Pala already exist. Social media echo chambers already exist. I think that claim is just a little far-fetched. The second clash in this debate is on polarization. Their argumentation is very mitigatory and assertive so far because they said that media companies are not extreme. They cater towards moderates and that's why they don't have an incentive to be biased. Note crucially that bias and extremism are two very different things. You don't have to be biased. You don't have to be extreme to cherry pick examples to make an argument. We think a lot of people People have been talking about the negative aspects of lockdown during COVID, even if they're not the, like economic aspects, even though they're not the most extreme people. So we think that that is an issue that can still exist. But in addition to that, the reason that bias is worse is because media organizations currently have an incentive to use people's biases to worsen polarization. Because if they continue to tell people what they want to hear, even moderate individuals are more likely to stick with them. So we think that polarization increases for as long as the fairness doctrine is not implemented to a greater extent. Then they say that we can do things like cross-check and peer review. But we don't think that people are actually willing to read all the cross-checks and like the analysis later on of why these media organizations are biased. If you like what you're hearing, you're probably going to stick with it. So how does that change on our comparative? Two ways. Firstly, people who consume media and who, uh, who are already biased are forced to check their biases on our side of the house because of the fact that it is continuously prevalent in the news media that they watch. But secondly, the people who are coming into, uh, people who are coming into politics and getting access to news uh, without set biases are more likely to have a holistic view of how current affairs take place, which means they're less likely to be subject to misinformation. They're more likely to do things like, uh, they're more likely to to make holistic choices on who to vote for, on whether they should take vaccines, etc. On our comparative panel, we told you that polarization is a problem, but the only side that actually does something about it. The final question in this debate is on abuse and manipulation of the doctrine. They say that it's easy for governments to exploit the uh, exploit um, these uh, the, the the fact that there's a panel here that exists. I would say that it's easier in a democracy for governments to exploit a lack of legislation than for uh, than for governments to manipulate legislation that already exists. Two reasons why: because when the government chooses to uh, chooses to um, manipulate legislation, it looks really bad on that image. Let's say that you that you unfairly treat an opposing media organization. That media organization is now going to expose that unfairness to its viewers uh, and opposers of your government to begin with. We think that this emboldens oppositions, encourages protests, encourages swing voters to side against you in crucial elections. So there are strategic incentives for governments to not be biased. Panel, at the end of the day, we prove to you that we solve a problem that is extremely prevalent in society, while the opposition does very little to do so. Propose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker and now call upon the opposition whip. Hello, am I visible and audible? Um, you are not visible yet, you are audible. Let's see. I'm not visible. Oh. Sorry. Now you're visible. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, I like my POIs verbally, please. Is, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so. Okay, I will be starting my speech in three, two, one. The government side tried to use an example to make their speech more intuitive, and yet they only ended up creating a tension within their case. In their very first speaker, they said that media is only going to report on the economic sides of COVID and therefore people are going to be biased. And yet in their whip speaker, they just said that people already know that there are other things to consider rather than just the economic aspects of COVID lockdown, which is it? Exactly the fact that just because media is somewhat biased, people still know there are other sides. They prove that themselves 
Therefore, they have never been able to prove that they have any benefits. This tension was devastating for their case. Okay, four things I'd like to do in this debate. First of all, flag out an unengaged point that is an independent path to victory, our point on coverage of information. Secondly, talk about the model and clarify what the government can and will do. Thirdly, engage on the principle. Fourthly, compare on the theme of polarization. Okay. Firstly, on our unengaged point, our second argument, and coming from first, regarding the coverage of information and investigative journalism and reports on minorities. This has never been unengaged to. Our mechanism that investors invest in these things because they want to um, push, cover, uh, push the media in order to give reports that are favorable to them, once they have, they can, they can no longer push some uh, stories that are favorable to them, they're never going to invest in them. Therefore, there's going to be less investment. Therefore, there's going to be less coverage. This whole thing has been unengaged to why is this so, so detrimental for them? Because without coverage of information, there is no choice because information was the prerequisite to anything that they said. Our side, the fact that we get information comes analytically prior to anything they're trying to propose. This was an independent path to victory. They already lose the debate. Now, secondly, I'd like to clarify on the feasibility of this model and whether the government will have any influence. Okay, so the as is the FCC fair? They tried to say that there are other political parties going to be opposing it. First of all, not every democracy is going to be a representative uh, government. And so sometimes one political party just own controls the government, in which the fact that the government is going to be funding the SCC means they have to listen to the government in some way. The government is still going to be able to influence it. Furthermore, even if there are opposition parties, if they're constantly arguing about what the metrics is going to be, they're never going to be effective in regulating anything. Rather, this is only going to mean that it takes time for media to put anything out into the public, which means that citizens who are unregulated, by the way, are going to report on SNS about what is actually happening. And the fact that those are going to be the sources of information because they are actually the ones reporting it faster. Now that I've proven that the FCC is ineffective and going to influence the government, uh, going to be influenced by the government, what is the government's incentive? Are they more incentivized to be corrupt and try to push their own narratives? Or are they going to try to keep it fair? Right? The government's reasoning is that the citizens are going to backlash against them and therefore they're going to be fair. Okay, let's compare which one is going to get you more backlash. Are you going to get backlash for potentially hiding information that the citizens don't know whether you hit or not? Or are you going to get backlash for putting out a story into the public that harms your reputation? The latter is clearly more probable. You're more likely to get backlash if you put information out there that is actively harming you. Therefore, the government is incentivized to hide those stories. Therefore, they're going to be more corrupt than fair. Now, moving on to the second about the principle, right? So let me directly engage with this in saying that it is completely contingent on their practical and so far as we have taken out their practical, their principle does not stand. Now, let me prove why our side is actually superior on the counterfactual, because having control over political perspectives through which media reports on news has very little influence on the ability of viewers to make a rational decision. The reason is because even in uh, the reason is not because even in the absence of control, there are going to be access to multiple sources of media. They're going to be able to talk to different people. They're, they're going to be engaging with other people. However, the media is the, therefore, regardless of how the media tells the story, is not really going to influence whether you choose right or left. Rather, the fact that the media is the only actor that can cover up the story, uncover the stories that are currently not revealed is very critical because not knowing who is corrupt in the government is actually the only thing, that's the only one that the, the media is the only one that can reveal that information. So basically, I'm trying to say is that the ability to choose when you see multiple sides is largely symmetric on both sides. Our side is the only side that can protect the unique benefit of allowing people to choose based on niche information that we can provide. Now, additionally, their whole point was content, their whole uh, principle led to the fact that it allows, their, of choice, led to the fact that it allows them to make choices that maximize their utility. However, this was completely contingent on the fact that the government actually has the ability to reflect these choices in policies. Insofar as our side has proved that there's more accountability for the government through investigative journalism and uncovering the fact of the corruption within the government, our side is the side that actually enables the government to ensure that people's voices and choices are actually reflected to improve the lives of the citizens. In conclusion, our side can both protect the choices and ability to reflect these choices. Therefore, we are more uh, are we better achieve their principle as a as well as their practical benefits they're trying to achieve from their principle before i move on to the comparison of the polarization i'd like to take your point of information
If, as you concede, only a small minority of extremists switch to alternative platforms, wouldn't advertisers and, inv and investors continue to find it profitable to invest in media, given that the vast majority of moderates remain? Our, our fact, as our explanation as to why investors are not going to invest is not the fact only that the media is going to be less popular. It is the fact that the government is, for example, Twitter doesn't want... if. In the status quo, if Twitter doesn't want something bad published about them, they can pressure the media into not saying it. On the other hand, that's why they invest in it. On your side, Twitter doesn't get any advantage because you have to show opposing views as well. Therefore, Twitter cannot do anything beneficial for them. That is why they lose investment. Please listen to our argument. Now, comparison on the theme of polarization. So there are some conflicting characterizations between both sides, so let me clear that up. First of all, is media extremist or moderate in the status quo? The only reason they give you is that Jeff Be Bezos owns and that therefore it is extremist. There's a logical leap here. Rather, we have proposed to you that corporations are going to check and balance each other in this status quo. And rather that major majority of mainstream media is mo uh, the viewers of it are moderate. Therefore, they're going to cater to a more moderate view. Even if, uh, so basically media is currently more moderate than they are extremist. Now, secondly, on the characterization of citizens, let me explain to you that the government side literally thinks people live in echo chambers that are physical chambers. No, people are engaging with people of other different political views because of they go to things like school, they go to things like uh, they talk with their family who have slightly different views. They are always countered with their beliefs because they are constantly engaging with other people as well. Therefore, they are going to be able to still choose even if um, there's the media slightly biased. People already know that other views exist. Now, how are different people going to react? There's not a tension in our case. There are many different people. It's not either you are extremist or you are moderate. There are people in the middle who have slightly opinionated about the uh, the media, uh, about politics. We say these are the people that are the biggest delta within the debate because they're the ones who are going to be moving to alternative media. These people becoming, these few people becoming radical is extremely harmful insofar as the few increase, the marginal increase in people who become radical is much larger than the marginal increase in people who can become more fair and neutral. Therefore, even, uh, our burden was not to prove that the majority of people are going to opt into alternative media insofar that our claim relied on the fact that even a few people opting into alternative media was immense harm. They needed to engage with this and they completely failed. It is too late for them to do so in reply. So, so proud to oppose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker and uh, close out the constructive phase. And now I'd like to call upon the opposition reply. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Speech will start in three, two, one. I'm going to make the winning piece of weighing on our side extremely clear at the start of my speech as to why even if the majority of individuals are moderate, which we concede from the very first speech, why that more people and the minority of individuals opting into alternative media and confirming their biases was the worst harm in the debate. We told you that even if the number of people who are extremists are small, the fact that they opt into these alternative medias does massive harm because uniquely on their side, they tip the tipping point for more individuals to opt into these pieces of alternative media. Media. More people are likely to become extremists because people who are not moderate right now will opt into this because of confirmation bias. And that was the mechanism I gave you that they did not respond to. But secondly, the people who are extremists right now now have the capacity to mobilize this extremism into action. On our side, because they are on mainstream media, the amount of influence that they have is massively diluted by the vast individuals of moderates. So it's hard for them to use this to collectively cause harm. So sure, Trump Pollar exists on their side, but it is uniquely on their side when Parler has the capacity to create harm, to riot against the capital and to create massive political damage. And sure, maybe some extremists have long-term trust with a news organization, but as they say, there is a degree and there is a trade-off. For people who have grown up getting told that getting an abortion brings them to hell for eternity, even if the news they watched was something they had exposure to from a young age, they would probably still switch anyways because they are more scared of burning in hell than they are of the trust to this news organization. Two things I'm going 
going to engage in. Firstly, let's bring back the principal argument I told you about in second. Our principal split was quite simple, which is that neutrality that they support, which is the principle of their argument, is a facade, and that rather it is an unjust intervention of the government. The response we get from WIP is that it is easier in a democracy for people to, ex that it is hard to, for people to exploit this in a democracy because there are things like legislature, and it looks bad if they manipulate these types of things. But we already preempted this to you in second when we told you that the way in which governments control media are many times invisible. They do things like changing the way that governments and that they change the way that news and news media collect statistics. They change the way in which they give them funding depending on whether or not they concede to these types of things. And that was the invisible mechanism in which they have to use and they need to concede to. But secondly, regarding which it has better media, government whip realizes that they were strategically off and that proving media companies have an incentive to be extremist was unwinnable. So instead, they assert that social media is now going to become less polarized as because of the fairness doctrine. Two things to note here. One, this is entirely an assertion. There is literally zero mechanism as to why this is the case. But secondly, it is not true. As we told you in first, alternative media cannot opt into mainstream media, which is already saturated, which is why their only source of consumer base is the people who are severely extremist, which is why they are the main source of people that they can see to and the people that they get opt-in from. But more importantly, let's talk about our claim of funding, which is the independent path to victory that we claim in this debate, where we told you that there is an increase of information, specifically in the most important areas. Notice then that this was the wing that got very little engagement to, which was that, sure, the most visible or long-term treat reports were likely to be symmetric, but at the moment in which you lose viewers, the incentive for sponsors to sponsor you to a massive degree decreases. And for the most important pieces of information that mobilize change for minorities, that get long-term investigative journalism that exposes corrupt politicians, that is the accountability mechanism the proposition asserts exists, that can only happen when you have long-term funding on our side. And this was specifically the types of places where the funding was likely to get taken out first, because even if only a few media organizations or a few sponsors pulled out, that lack of money was most likely to translate into those areas that were the most important that had no other alternatives. What this means then is that you're more likely to use this money on their side for alternative means of advertising, things like YouTube ads, funding magazines, alternative media, because that's where a lot of individuals are going to be, which further entrenches these alternative medias as well. So we flip their case. Proposition supports undocumented migrants being put in cages on the border as an inevitable consequence or des deserving. We think there are certain views that are so harmful and the fairness doctrine allows us to hide behind the facade of truth behind euphemisms and people playing the devil's advocate. I've never been prouder to oppose. All right, I'd like to thank the speaker and to close out this debate, I'd like to call upon the proposition reply. Hi, can you hear me? Three questions in this speech. First, which side reduces political polarization? Secondly, reducing the likelihood of state abuse. Thirdly, the profitability of news organizations. First on reducing political polarization. I want to first prove by opposition's argumentation on migration is unlikely. They say that if we attempt to implement the fairness doctrine on traditional media, that this will lead to a migration to alternative media, particularly among extremists. We told you a number of things. Firstly, in instances where the alternative media that they migrate to is functionally the same as broadcast media, such as, for example, internet talk shows or news shows that are organizations, we could apply the same regulations. So importantly, as the viewership increases, there's a checking mechanism to ensure that the fairness doctrine will apply in these instances as well, to which we heard no response. But the second thing that we told you is that if it is true that it is largely extremists who will migrate to alternative media, it's very unclear why this is the tipping point, although Japan continues to say that it is. 
Presumably, on their side of the house, if, altern if traditional media were ever to attempt to moderate for the same incentives that they gave, which is that you want to appeal to the broad majority of moderates and attract corporate sponsorship, then these same extremists would also flock to alternative media on their side of the house. So presumably, this is an inevitable harm that either side will have to contest with. And it's unclear why this motion in particular massively increases the incentive to flock to alternative media in a way that the incentives of traditional media don't on their side of the house. Finally, we told you why. For the vast majority of people, even people who are slightly extreme and radical, the degree of substitutability between social media and traditional media does not exist. The level of familiarity, age as being a limiting factor to be able to access social media, the fact that you have less trust in social media and therefore you rely less on it. Even if you don't buy this analysis, we also told you why traditional media is more likely to act as a check on social media on our side of the house for two reasons. Firstly, in third, we told you why traditional media often controls the kind of information that is dispersed on social media. And in first and second, we told you why we reduce the effects of a biased social media presence of traditional media organizations like CNN and Fox News, which also disperse a significant amount of information through social media. They say that on weighing that they've been, because the ability for extremists to mobilize is significant. They were unresponsive to the POI that they, that they asked us, which was that the ability to mobilize already exists in the status quo. It is unclear why this is likely to significantly increase the incentive for extremists to mobilize if already traditional media appeals to moderates. But secondly, our intuitive weighing from first was never responded to, which is that if fewer people believe in increasingly biased perspectives of the other side, it means that you are more likely to vote in a rational way. It means that the broad majority of people to whom political parties crater are likely to be more moderate. This is where reducing political polarization becomes important. Opposition concedes that the status quo is insufficient when they point to the fact that most people, although they are moderates, are still exposed to biased media. This points to the issue that we illustrated in first and to which we heard little response, which is that the cognitive dissonance that they use in their argumentation is a reason why even moderates will not tolerate extremist views, will not seek out alternative views rather. Perhaps if we bring those alternative views to them, they are willing to tolerate it and won't migrate to other platforms, but the incentive to seek these out given the constraints of limited time and the incentive to limit cognitive this are twofold. Firstly, we have a greater exposure to alternative views, and it's harder to mischaracterize the opposition, which means we fulfill our principle of people having informed consent. But secondly, we improve fact checking. Finally, on the profitability of news organizations, we pointed out in a POI that these news organizations will remain profitable, given that advertisers will still find it profitable, and that given that the doctrine itself will apply to all media organizations. Perhaps the trade-off that we need to make in this debate is that investigative journalism is marginally less likely. But their mechanism of corporate sponsorship is even worse because it means you can't criticize the corporate. We are far more willing to have governments have a greater degree of control over the media than completely rely on corporate sponsorship, given that governments have greater checking mechanisms on them in most countries, even in weaker democracies, as we illustrated in argumentation, and given that governments have incentives not to misuse the fairness doctrine analysis in second, to which there was an insufficient response. For all of these reasons proposed. I think it will do that. All right. I want to thank everyone for what was an incredibly high quality debate and a very close one. And that is represented by the fact that it was not a unanimous decision. Um, I think that that's also a testament to the fact that all of us saw many of the same issues in this debate. We saw many of the same arguments and it ultimately came back to how we weighed things and saw the round play out, not necessarily in disagreements, which means that we did think that each team ran a lot of material and each team did prevail on some of it, but ultimately a majority felt one way about how that played out and how that ended up impacting in the end. Ultimately, on a 2-1 split, with myself and Rook in the majority, we gave it to the team in Proposition Sri Lanka over uh, the team in Opposition Japan. So how did this play out? We thought that there were several areas of clash in this debate. Um, the first one being a principal clash. Secondly, looking at a lot of stuff in terms of the model, in terms of what is proposition doing and can they successfully do that, which both involves what's covered in terms of social media versus not social media. Can you sort of fairly implement this? How are you going to ultimately determine what you're covering? Um, and third, and sort of thirdly, basically on that, what, what capacities for state abuse and whether or not that's necessarily harmful, which sort of areas in the bank. 
then we thought there was a clash over extremism. Where is there likely to be sort of more polarization in terms of society? And how do we end up weighing this up in terms of the debate? Um, I want to deal with the principle first, because there was general agreement on the panel, as well as it seemed to some degree within the debate, that as opposition themselves noted uh, towards the end, the principle is in many ways pragmatic. The principle ends up basically being that there's ultimately a right to state information, that there is a ultimately a right to state information. There is a right to basically be acting on correct information if you're going to be voting. States derive legitimacy from being able to give an informed choice. Why the right to the informed choice is not properly protected under status quo. And this goes into a representation thing, how this preempts all sort of opinions being valid and how speech concerning public affairs should be held to a prior standard. We're willing to buy all of this, but the thing is, we don't necessarily think it's necessarily contested that there is an importance to it. What then does being contested is, do you actually improve the level of information people are receiving? And on net, does this basically function both within the traditional media and does that trump people exiting from it? And because it's ultimately pragmatic, it does as opposition said, ultimately depend on who wins the rest of the debate. So in a sense, proposition runs a principle, it's uncontested, it is the principle in the round, but ultimately they have to prove that they actually accomplish the things that everyone agrees they have a principle duty for in order to win. So it ends up not being particularly important. This then leads us into the sort of first area of clash that was important for the panel. Now, the reason I want to sort of look at the model is that there's a lot of things that arise in terms of the model as to what proposition is doing and to what extent they can do it versus what is likely to happen on the other side. And there's a lot of argumentation that's buried within it. Some of that argumentation, uh, for instance, ends up not sort of necessarily being tested, which is one, can you sort, who is going to be doing this? And secondly, what is covered? Well, first of all, I think it's best to start with what is covered. Then secondly, who is going to be covering it and deciding what it is and what are the impacts of it? The first thing in terms of who's being covered is we get a very clear model from proposition that they're going to be covering, not just, for instance, traditional broadcast media, but they're going to be covering other things. They're going to be covering social media. They're going to be covering podcasts and other things. Now, this is an implicit effort to model this in. Now, I think this is something that is to some degree controversial in this debate. It's controversial in this debate because opposition from the first opposition speech is deciding to base one of their major harms on the idea that if you do this in the traditional media, one, you're going to make it less attractive to people, which is an argument we'll come back to later. But two, that this will lead them looking for alternatives, for instance, in alternative and online media. Now, ultimately, uh, our feeling in terms of where this is basically comes down to a, a basically a large degree of this is we're willing to buy the idea that, for instance, there isn't an absolute prop fiat to say that you're going to apply this to all forms of alternative media and necessarily do it. But the two sort of challenges we get is that the motion says news media and with significant reach. And while we're ultimately willing to say that the first one is ambiguous, at the point at which it's significant reach, we think that the second proposition is correct in saying that if things get as big as, for instance, the Ben Shapiro show. So you're effectively having an entire company like the Daily Wire or things that's making a large amount of money, doing advertising, doing it, that those things will be covered. And while we're willing to accept that there will be some degrees of alternative things, the point at which the one ones with the most reach are going to be subject to the fairness doctrine. The scope of alternative media that exists on opposition that is not covered is one less than in the status quo, which as proposition points out that alternative media already exists to a degree and is also sort of mitigated. Now that doesn't mean that opposition can't run the impacts of people looking at alternative forms. But it means that when we end up coming up with the comparative, which we'll come to at the end when we talk about polarization, which is how much worse does polarization get? They're sort of operating in that comparative in the view of majority panel in a situation in which the most, the, the, the alternative means that have the largest reach 
are covered by this, as is Tucker Carlson. And to that extent, it becomes a situation where opposition has to either engage on enough people going to the sort of alternative media with lesser reach for that to sort of have the impact, or they need to basically win on other independent lines, such as state enforcement and how it's going to be implemented. This brings us to the idea of sort of state abuse and how it's going to be implemented. Proposition gives us a model where they're going to model this a bit like the FCC in the United States, where they say there's going to be representation by both parties in a multi-party system. They're presuming there will be some, even in weak democracy, rule of law. The way at least I uh, read this is that even a country like Singapore, which is one party dominant, the, my, there'll be still be a cap on the number of members from each party, which means opposition representation. There will be suits in the courts to sort of go off and challenge it. There will be public backlash and demands that you enforce it. Uh, the challenge we get from this is sort of a couple fold. One, that for instance, we think this will be imperfect because governments will have an incentive to do this. This will be their ability to do it can either come outside of normal sort of legal means, which is things like changing the way you calculate stats and abusing rules. Or secondly, in countries that are one party or authoritarian, this will be less effective. How did sort of each of these sort of play out? Um, I think the feeling was that at the point at which um, you're basically, they're setting these things up as sort of checks on it, ultimately the impacts are comparative overall, which means that it's not opposition's job to say that there are gonna be cases where this will be less effective than others. I think there's concession of that when you have weaker democracies. The question is, is this tool going to be more effective than nothing or are the abuse of this tool going to make it worse than nothing? So when we look at those two things subsequent to it, um, I think we feel that some of these checks, while imperfect, probably do function in places that do have some degree of institutions and rule of law. Obviously, the weaker the courts are and the less democratic the state is, they, they work less. Uh, the thing is, is that at the point at which a state has only one party, doesn't have independent courts, and has authoritarian government, the, the impacts in this round are probably minimal because the amount of independence and scope of free media is probably minimal. So I think ultimately, at least the majority of the panel felt that those things were not necessarily where the debate was, which meant that they had a sort of minimalistic impact. I think when it came to other state abuse mechanisms, for instance, manipulation, doing things behind the scenes. It's unclear how this policy influences that if they could still do it elsewhere. Now, I think part of the panel did point out that all propositions pushback on this could have been significantly clearer and more forceful. And it ultimately led us in a situation where we're unsure if opposition is comparative here in terms of proving harms, but where a proposition isn't necessarily pointing out the degree to which they may not be comparative, which leaves us in sort of how much do we weigh that? And ultimately a majority felt that Prop opposition to some degree was setting up perhaps an impossible burden of saying that its proposition needs to prove this works in all cases. And if it doesn't work in some cases, in some instances where their own comparative doesn't necessarily, that that's enough for them to win. And a majority did not feel that way. So did not feel there was necessarily an alternative harm here. So that then led us in a situation where we're trying to engage in a world where this is working. And that means that we look at polarization. So what does proposition say? Proposition suggests that a large number of people are sort of, to agree, moderates. They, they're invested in their traditional media. They may like some degrees of biases and be aware of Fox, but one, they're unlikely to switch because there's a degree of laziness. They're invested in what they see. Um, they also are, and they also say, that I think is important, is they frame bias, not necessarily as explicit, but implicit, not just in terms of what's covered, but what isn't. So for instance, the selection of stories you're going to see, and this is gonna be important because this is probably where the strongest um, opposition pushback is, but also in terms of if you focus heavily on crime, this can be used to portray African-Americans negatively. If you focus on COVID and lockdowns and you only focus on the economic stuff, but not the other things, and their argument in terms of balance is that you need to cover both sides of stories and you need to find roughly equivalent speakers. Now, I think there's actually probably was a lot of potential to attack, especially the equivalence on speakers and how necessarily do it. What are the responses? I think one of them 
is you necessarily get the idea that you're going to avoid controversial issues. This is sort of the Philippines example with abortion. Uh, proposition, I think, is suggesting that you're issue neutral. All you're saying is that you're going to have to provide sort of both sides. Now, I think there is an argument that this is also not fully responsive, but it's not necessarily followed up on in terms of pushback and the sort of abortion thing or choice of stories goes out. So we are left very much with one, the push that people are gonna to want to go and go onto alternative stuff. That even if a small number of people do it, that this is going to lead to significant harms and where we're going. Now, I think in terms of the sort of alternative stuff, because we're buying the mitigation, and I think ultimately this is something to some degree opposition is aware of as an issue by the end of debate, which is why they pivot to why there is a limited number of harms. They, they very much focus on why the online stuff is worse. We're not really, we do buy the idea that the number of people are gonna shift is limited and things like Ben Shapiro are being there. So then the question becomes, what are the relative sort of impacts of this? So one, I think that the issue we come up with here is sort of a weighing issue, is what is the impact? We repeatedly hear, for instance, that it's worse if Trump is banned on Twitter, goes to parlor, or it's worse if people are doing it. But at what level of number is this worse? We actually do buy the idea about minorities. We buy that the extremism you see on the extremes of alternative media online are probably significantly worse than the extremes we're seeing offline. But we're not necessarily sure why, if it's even a small number, why that necessarily outweighs. And that becomes a significant sort of issue when for a lot of us, we're attempting to sort of weigh on it. Um, I did, I was, I flagged something when I was going to uh, flip over on this and give me just one second to look over my notes because there was something I remember saying that I said was the strongest thing on opposition, but now uh, this is going to sound weird, but I just forgotten where I was on that on notes. Uh, where was it? Um, sorry, this is going to sound really weird. Uh, do people remember the, the thing I flagged on that just briefly? This is going to look awful on video, I know. I have part of the technical thing flagging. Selective reporting, selective choice, uh, selective spokespeople. What was it? What was it? Sorry, I, I, I have. Sorry, I'm just. This is uh, 8 a.m. and I just got up early. I am. Just give me 20 seconds to look over where I was going to use. Going to have it. Oh yes. So okay. So the other big issue that came up here, however is not necessarily whether or not the impact of switching to online media is worse. It is whether or not you're going to be hurting the traditional media. Now, the reason this is strong is that if proposition is correct and there's significant attachments to traditional media, and that even if people distrust other things, they trust what they're doing, there are unique things it does. And this is the investigative reporting where opposition is arguing that there's stories that require a significant investment of resources in order to establish. Now, this significant investment basically is not going to exist if there's a significant financial exodus of people moving off into alternative things, because you're not going to be able to hire the reporters, you're not going to be able to build these structures, which means stories like the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal are not going to be fully covered. Now, I think this is the strongest material in some ways, the proposition that the panel found. Now, not necessarily the strongest in terms of potential, but the strongest material that we felt that opposition sort of won on. Now, this is the place where to dial back to the start. The issue about the Ben Shapiro and other stuff matters because Ultimately, in order for this to work, uh, we felt a majority felt that opposition needed to prove that not just that there would be a small exodus to the online stuff and that that extremism would be bad, but there'd be a significant enough exodus away that it would impact the funding and the amount of money advertisers and others put into traditional media such that they'd no longer be able to do it. And at the point at which things like Ben Shapiro and other stuff are being covered by it, and that's mitigated. 
it wasn't necessarily proven to us why there would be such a financial hit that it would fully undermine it. So while we were willing to buy that there might be some reduction in doing it, at the point at which this round becomes whether or not a small number of people doing extreme, going to sort of extreme online media being radicalized is more important than the majority, having more of this fairness doctrine to some degree imperfectly applied, but in most places doing it, we ended up having to weigh those two. So we felt that one, because of the way the frame and because proposition kind of won on covering the largest social media, opposition was unable to prove that you would necessarily have so much money coming out of traditional media, you wouldn't be able to do any investigative stuff. So their strongest harm that potentially outweighed the proposition case did not prevail. Then secondly, in terms of weighing, we felt that the harm that did prevail which is that some people will go to this extremist stuff. It is significantly worse for minorities, um, but it wasn't clear why this outweighs the benefits on proposition. It was assertive why it was, but we didn't feel that that weighing was there. So the thing that opposition did win on, we didn't feel outweighed. And for that reason, a majority felt that proposition ended up narrowly prevailing. I mean, a general sort of comments on this before moving in without doing it. Um, I think the panel did feel that this was a very model heavy round and that proposition put a lot of stuff that probably was arguments into the model, which strategically worked out for them very well in this debate, um, largely because I think for opposition, opposition needed to take out things that were in the model or do it in order for a lot of the argumentation to work. For instance, a lot of the argumentation about the social media alternative required proving that social media regulation was out of the round or that the stuff that was out of the round was a significant amount. The same thing in terms of figuring out where this round is set in terms of impacts. Um, because a lot of the impacts, for instance, of governmental abuse exist on a spectrum. Uh, between sort of authoritarian states where those are probably maximal likelihood of occurring, but minimal impact in terms of this debate on comparative because they have limited free media. So weak democracies where it's probably in the middle and then strong democracies where the prop mechanism is most likely to work um, and there are differential impacts. And I think position there, figuring out where this round is likely to have the biggest impacts would also have been advantageous there in terms of the clash. And a lot of these clashes are decided not so much by who ends up winning them in terms of sub points, which is where we thought that opposition was very effective, but ultimately who ends up framing what this round is about and where it's sat, which then determines how we weigh up the arguments and why they end up going to the proposition. I hope that is helpful. Um, are people wanting individual? Um, uh, Team Japan would like individual feedback, if that's okay with you guys. Okay. Team Japan, individual. Yep. Um, I, I can go with Sri Lanka. Um, I mean, uh, Isaac, do you want to go with, um, uh, because you understand, do you want to go with um, uh, Japan? Oh, actually, uh, does Japan want individual first because of uh, Isaac majority and Isaac, if you want to go with Sri Lanka because uh, you split, do you want to go with them? If okay, not, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, Rock, do you want to go with Isaac or do you want to stick with me here? Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I can be uh, okay. either of you. Okay. I mean, do you want to go with Isaac and then flip here? I'm sorry, yeah. this is a very strong panel, so I'm unsure how to sort of... Set I'll do that. Off. I'll go with I'll go with Isaac and then come okay. back. All right. Uh, so Sri Lanka and Rock should be going to the um, prop prep room. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So um, I sort of was starting to give the individual feedback. I think what mattered a lot here was that proposition very cleverly buried a ton of critical stuff in the model. And at the point at which you, you, you sort of give some view of seeing this because you do sort of a two line, uh, like a one line thing about what you think this is and the stance. And um, 
I think in the rebuttal, I'm just reading this out, alternative, uh, and this is from Ayaka's speech, alternative social media will not be part. Motion says news media and with significant reach. So the problem is the second part of that clause and with significant reach is kind of opening the way for second prop to come up with this. Now, I, I'm gonna be perfectly honest on this. I actually, the moment proposition said they're covering social media, I went, can they do that in my notes? And I really wasn't sure they could. The, th the way this exchange played out though, with you doing significant reach as your rebuttal, and then basically moving on to the feasibility, the who constitutes the FCC board, the nitpicking, then allow them in the second prop to come up with their, okay, but things like Ben Shapiro, at the point at which the Daily Wire becomes a corporation or LLC and incorporates, that's gonna be covered, we'll cover them on taxes and stuff. For me, that's a sufficient thing. And there is no subsequent pushback at all pretty much to that which means the end thing for the debate for the majority of the panel is Ben Shapiro is being covered. Alex Jones is being covered. Anyone who's bringing in like millions of dollars from alternative stuff is being covered. And that effectively means one, uh, you lost a frame in this debate that you didn't need to lose because I'm not sure the motion gives it to them. And I think that you have a, I think you do have an argument in terms of the motion that what they're doing is, I don't, a squirrel would be unfair, but they're being greedy with the definition in this debate. But more importantly, almost your entire first part of your opposition and your impacts are dependent on not letting them do this. Because once you let them regulate social media, then all of your alternative impacts become how, day, how much not is social, is alternative media worse and more extreme? But is it sufficiently worse and extreme than the small number of people who are going to smaller alternative media that isn't covered outweighs everything else? So you're basically already behind in the first two or three minutes and then after the first three speeches be, by how it plays out. And like, I'm sorry, on this, I, I sort of want to stress this because like this is at least for me and my impression was rock, but you can ask them. This was a big deal for me in terms of my call. <laughs> in terms of weighing it up. Um, and I think it was unnecessary in terms of doing it. Uh, feasibility stuff, a bit nitpicky and doesn't really come up hugely. Who's gonna be on the board? That's another sort of sliding scale thing that I think that you're not necessarily, I mean, it's probably true to some extent, but why is it winning? But ultimately your, your impacts are this. Now, I, I wanna say, I, I think you do an excellent job on the fairness doctrine, forcing a shift to alternative media. I think the setup for this is great. I think the people have more incentive to opt in, why people shift, it's uncomfortable to confront on it. People lose trust in the media. Alternative media is more incentive, even if they promote fake news, they do it. Uh, counterfactual, mainstream media is greater things. They're losing, companies are unwilling to be doing it. The self-regulation, why it's unnecessary, actually probably should have been uh, flagged later on. Um, but, it's not this way there. Um, okay. Um, so I think you prove in the second thing why less capacity is incredibly harmful and why this is important. But I think it's the linkage for less capacity is kind of requires you to prove your first point in order to get your second point, which is why the fairness doctrine hinders ability to report on important issues. I'm sorry if this is too strategic versus delivery, but the delivery is excellent. Uh, It's really just the strategic meta stuff that unfortunately undermines delivery and like analytical content in isolation might very well be winning or better than prop on this. Uh, Achir, do you want to add anything on that? Or? Um, yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything that Daniel has said so far. I also agree with the point about things being meta. In terms of just like the base basics, delivery, delivering comparative, mechanization, I think this was perfectly well done on opposition side, and I commend you guys for that. I think areas you could improve on are just the meta stuff. So specifically in my case, I saw the debate really wash down two clashes, firstly on um, polarization and secondly on government abuse. And here there was definitely like room in my, like in my deliberation for opposition to come out on top, 
um, because I did end up giving like the government abuse point over to opposition. Specifically, um, you know, proposition contends that, oh, there won't be government abuse because there are democratic checks and balances, even in the weakest democracies, there are opposition parties, there are courts, things like that, right? Opposition contends and says that, oh, there's a lot of nuanced, indivisible methods that governments can like check, um, can manipulate the news. And secondly, this is, I, uh, I also bought into your like argument on profitability, given that like there will be less corporate sponsorship, there will be less money for, even if it's marginal, there'll be less money for the most expensive things such as investigative journalism and, and like unveiling corruption, which is analytically prior to all the checks and balances that opposition is trying to like respond by, right? The problem for me in this debate was given that I given that these two teams were operating are winning on two different clashes. Um, so like I gave the polarization to proposition uh, point, and I think the majority of the panel agreed on this, but I also gave the government abuse point point to opposition. Given this, I I think you guys could have swayed me over if towards the end of the speech, towards like whip and like reply if you're explicitly able to illustrate why um, like the government abuse point weighed much more heavy and like more heavily than the point on polarization and extremism. Like even if you lost the prior clash, how could you have won that one? Um, I am not sure on how like you guys could improve on this given that I'm also um, uh, like oh. news and judging, um, but regardless. So, yeah. I'm actually in agreement on it. I think the issue with the governmental abuse for me is not necessarily that you lose on it per se. It's that you don't impact it because the impact, this is yeah. why I meant, is the impact is a sliding scale. The places where you most win on it seem to have the lowest relative impact, whereas the places where it's most ambiguous seem to have the higher one. So I think you do prove the government abuse will exist and the government abuse will be total in countries that have other forms of governmental abuse. But and then, and then probably government abuse will be less, the stronger other things are. And I think making this the impact as to why that's winning as opposed to true is a big issue. Um, so I want to go back to, um, like, I'll just run on to the second, which is, I think, you on. Um, I think this is a good idea, proposition idea of neutrality, even if the major issues on broadcast are minority issues, um, principle. Okay, I think this is correct. You do basically wash out the principle here. You do an excellent job of doing it, which is, I would argue that we are the prerequisite to the principle. Uh, we achieve their end goal of principle accountability. I think you successfully prove that if you win on everything else, like you win on the practical, you also beat them on principle. Like, I think you have four points here, all of which are true and all of which end up establishing that you end up doing it. But the problem is that still leaves you with proving that you necessarily end up winning on it. Now, I think this is where, again, like the governmental stuff, like I see the FCC thing. Now, I think the FCC has an incentive to make it appear to work. A lot of my issues with governmental stuff is these things are probably true, but they're probably mitigatory in that they're saying why it won't work as well or why this might happen. Why is this going to be general? Why is this going to be represent majority of cases? And why is it going to be wider structural? I mean, I think they will happen. It's just how often and where and how important. Uh, decrease um, uh, things. Um, I think that in terms of your contrast with decreased polarization, this again is good. Um, I think this is, I think the, for the vast majority of people who are moderates are having friends from many different backgrounds. The friends from different backgrounds thing never really became important, but it played out weirdly, at least in my head in the sense that this seems like an argument that could work on both sides if it's true. Like it's a reason why this isn't a problem in the first place, but it also mitigates the extremism thing to a limited degree, why their side is worse, media can get captured by dominant parties, things like scandals. Um, all of this is kind of dependent on proving that governments will use this to weaponize it because they want to, because they control the courts and other things, which again runs into, I guess, the issue of the places where this is most likely to impact already probably have it. So I think ultimately it is there, but it's unclear why this is going to occur in countries where it's not necessarily overcurring, at least to myself and others. Um, I think that um, for third opens with attacking sort of contradiction. I'll flip in a minute. Um, I think the issue with contradictions, at least for me, is 
90% of the time people say something is intention, it comes off as not being generous to the other side, because there's usually a perfectly good explanation for why it's not, which we hear in the subsequent speech. Uh, which is not to say that you shouldn't ever do it, but I think teams are a bit too generous with accusing the other team of contradicting themselves. Uh, which is why I'm not sure it's the most effective thing, but others will comment momentarily in terms of how they see it. Unengaged argument, investigative journalism. I think you're correct. The investigative journalism point here, but that's dependent on proving you're not going to be able to get any more investigative journalism. I think you do conclusively prove that investigative journalism is a good thing. And if it doesn't exist, that's a big hit. Um, um, I think the problem with the model is actually kind of encapsulated in the third speech uh, in canon, which is they said they had other parties, not every democracy is going to have this, sometimes this, the government is funding this, sometimes the government is able to influence it. Like, all of those things are, sometimes in some places these things happen. Almost all of that is almost assuredly true. But how do we weigh that? How do we weigh these sometimes in some places, some governments will try and do this? How often, how many places? And I think that's a problem for majority panel when it came to sort of the way. Uh, and I think this comes up with the POI as well when they ask if only a small minority would switch. Um, and I think that the pivot to the sort of one in terms of polarization ends up being a little bit mega. Otherwise it's very well delivered, but I think in terms of it, the way in which you do the government thing kind of encapsulates both the strengths of the argument, it being true, and the weaknesses, it being not really weighed as well as it could. And I think that the reply is solid, even majority of individuals moderate. The principle split, yup, I mean, the principle is out. I do think pivoting to the funding thing is important, but again, it's dependent on proving that you win funding, not proving that if you win funding, you win the debate. I think probably a lot of us would be sympathetic to the argument you're making, but you need to prove you won on it, not if you won on it, it's an independent path to victory. But we agree, it is the correct thing to focus on there. Okay, I can swap uh, to the room with Sri Lanka. I'm sorry for leaving them waiting. Uh, which, they're in the prep room? Uh, prep, prep room, yeah. Okay. Debate yeah, uh, uh, I just quick quickly add one thing. I've I've heard some of the feedback, and I don't want to take uh, too much of your time. You have you 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 have the roll call soon. Just um, I think you did a fairly good job, but everything that Dan said, and also um, when when you when you do, of going on for, I was going on for a little bit of time on this. Um, oh, actually, I probably should. I don't know if I should stop the recording.